The Handmaid's Tale Elizabeth Moss and Max Minghella in The Handmaid's Tale, credit George Krejcik, Hulu My 16, 2018, Gilead is with a new Offered reminded herself earlier in this season of The Handmaid's Tale, taken from the Margaret Atwood novel, where it's attributed to and Lydia, the quote explains many of the painful storylines we've seen on the show, including Moira's inability to enjoy her new life in Canada and Janine's continuing reverence for God, for Aunt Lydia and for her former master, even though each presumably played a role in having exiled her to the colonies. Last week, Gilead finally wormed its way into Offred. Traumatized by her capture and guilt ridden over the execution of a man she basically forced to hide her, she has now been broken down enough to internalize Lydia's message, my fault, my fault, my fault. The only way to redeem herself is to abandon her identity as June, a free woman whose choice has just destroyed a family, and to become a blindly obedient handmaid again. We've been sent good weather isn't just the only thing she'll allow herself to say to Nick by the end of the episode, it's the only thing she'll allow herself to think. By the beginning of this week's episode, Seeds. June has fully re-inhabited Alfred, and Alfred is more of an empty dress than ever. Aunt Lydia has been making regular house calls in order to weigh her, measure her pregnant belly and shame her into taking two baths a day because she smells musty. Serena Joy is keeping track of Offred's bowel movements. When Nick catches Offred burning the Mayday letters, her response is robotic, not supposed to have these. Offred's experiment in submission ends as abruptly as it began, when she finds blood in her underwear, a sign that she could be having a miscarriage at a time when losing her baby could easily put her life in danger. A moment like this was inevitable, a docile servant with no interiority isn't exactly a captivating heroine. But I was disappointed that we didn't get to witness a few days in the life of a good handmaid. Unlike the extended torture sequences of which the show has grown so fond, the scene in Offred's bedroom when Serena and Lydia discuss her health as if she's not there illuminates so much about her plight. Her strong will made her life at the Waterford home tense, but at least asserting her personhood left her with some dignity. The bleeding only intensifies as the episode progresses. Offer tries and fails to conceal it, fashioning a makeshift maxi pad out of toilet paper. She grows faint. She turns the water crimson during one of her compulsory baths. A shot in which the water reflects Elizabeth Moss's face underscores her character's split identity. There's the real June and then there's Alfred, a flat, blurry mirror image drowning in a pool the same. Color is her uniform, the handmaid's tale, often uses blood excessively, manipulating viewers into feeling viscerally disgusted by the brutality of Gilead instead of trusting us to perceive its obvious cruelty and hypocrisy. In Seeds, however, that redness, which signals fertility as well as prostitution and violence, sums up what it means to be a handmaid. For Alfred, who still hasn't gotten over the guilt of stealing Luke from his first wife, the scarlet dress is also a scarlet letter. That the episode's writer, Kira Snyder, and director, Mike Barker, chose to actually show the blood staining her undergarments, a common female experience that we almost never see on television, feels like an implicit rebuke to the idea that women's bodies are musty or unclean. Another surprising rejoinder to this assumption comes from Serena, as she advises Nick's new, barely pubescent Akana wife, Eden, Sydney Sweeney, that it isn't a sin to take pleasure in sex within marriage. It can bring you closer together, or it should, anyway, Serena says, presumably speaking from experience. The exchange is a rare, possibly desperate attempt at girl talk from an isolated female character who resents her fellow wives, abuses her handmaids and Martha's, appears to envy Aunt Lydia's relative autonomy and once made a career out of undermining the rights of other women.
It isn't news that there is little warmth left in her marriage to Commander Waterford, but the scene in which she's chattering about Nick's attachment to Offred, in the transparent ploy to make her husband jealous, marks a nadir for their relationship. Eden, meanwhile, seems doomed to suffer in this cold, secretive household. Not only is she introduced in order to keep Nick away from Offred, but whether she believes she wants to marry him or not, she is effectively a child bride. The first time I saw him lift her veil, I gasped at how young she looked. This week's episode reveals a new facet of Gilead's structural misogyny, in which girls become victims of what Massachusetts law currently classifies as statutory rape, and then lose their childhoods to the demands of reproduction. The marriage also puts Nick in a position where he must either choose to commit sexual assault on a minor, making him deeply complicit in state-sponsored violence against women, or risk being labeled a dissident or a gender traitor, Gilead is with a new means different things to different characters. For Aunt Lydia, it's a mandate, blessing her every prayer and whip crack. Moira, it's a panopticon, making it impossible to let down her guard even when she knows no one is watching her. But for those in captivity, the phrase encapsulates Gilead's relentless affronts to their dignity. When, after collapsing from bloodlust and waking up in the hospital, Alfred promises her unborn child that she'll get them out of this place, she's reclaiming her dignity and kicking Gilead out of her head. When Janine throws a wedding for a dying woman and her girlfriend in the colonies, she's not just being naive. She's insisting on something more fundamental within us, on the dignity of two people in love, even in a hell where, as Emily says, we come here, we work, we die, blessed fruits, the scene in which Waterford asks his boss, Commander Price, to promote Nick is fascinating. As you might recall from the flashback in the 8th episode of Season 1, it was Price who recruited Nick to the pre-Gilead group Sons of Jacob before the revolution. So, they go way back. With that in mind, Price's unexplained refusal to reassign Nick suggests that Nick is at the Waterford specifically to keep an eye on the commander, the de facto spiritual leader in the colonies is a female rabbi, which raises some questions about the fate of Jews in Gilead. We haven't heard too much about what became of non-Christian people after the coup, but in Atwood's book, Jews who don't convert are repatriated to Israel.